Okay, part two, uh, the 19th of November, 2020, new 302. Okay, so um, again, as per my general commitment to... As per my general commitment to uh, give you slightly less material in the week that there are sort of double presentations and stuff, so I'm not overwhelming you, don't try to keep this inside 40 minutes. So one of the things that I wanted to do was I wanted to talk about essay writing. Um, now, this may be a relatively condensed kind of blast in a way. Uh, I, for a bunch of years, taught a multi-part workshop uh, on this. So, you know, like uh, quite, quite a few hours. Um, on essay writing and techniques in essay writing and so on and so forth. Um, uh, and I've taught that at a variety of levels. So I've taught essay writing from, from grade school to grad school. Um, yeah, and uh, I used to work as a professional writer. So I have some experience there. I've also obviously done a fair bit of, you know, whatever writing, academic writing. Uh, just myself and editorial work and so on and so forth. Um, I'm not going to make some claim that I'm some kind of uh, amazing master essayist or anything, but I have spent an enormous amount of time and effort both sort of reading about this and uh, and teaching it. I taught high school uh, and I taught, uh, what is that? Middle, middle school, grade eight, what's grade eight? It's uh, junior high, anyway, whatever. Um, so I've taught at a bunch of different levels and of course, um, you know, uh, I, I TA'd for a bunch of years before I taught and I've taught for a bunch of years. Uh, so I've done a fair bit of this kind of advisory work, especially when I was a TA. Um, and I used to work as a tutor and blah, 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 blah. The point is I've done lots of stuff around essays. So uh, I did have a whole course on it. We're not going to be able to cover that, but let's see what we can cover. So here's the thing. I mentioned this before, for many of you, for many of you, essays have been the bread and butter of your undergraduate career. They're very straightforward to you. They were straightforward to you when you were in high school. You find them intuitive and simple and straightforward. You enjoy writing. Um, maybe you do it at the last second, but it still turns out reasonably well. Okay, fine. Um, there may still be some interesting things for you to um, reflect on here. So I would encourage you anyway, and there are some sort of advanced sources that I'll recommend. Uh, as as I get going, um, but for a bunch of you, you're you know you're coming to this course from a variety of places. You know, uh, this is an interdisciplinary course, and so necessarily, I'm not assuming that everybody has come to this from an arts background. And if that's the case, it may have been quite a while if this is an elective for you since you've written an essay, right? If you're in the sciences, you may not be called upon to write essays. It's too bad. There should be more argumentation, uh, more training towards argumentation in the sciences. Um, you know, if you're coming to this from math or any number of other directions, it may just be the case that you're not sort of in the habit of writing papers. So a few things about essays. First off, uh, if you have uh, serious concerns about your uh, own abilities, you're not alone. Lots of people do. Writing is um, a really self-reflective process in lots of ways, and it tends to trigger people's inferiority complexes, and it tends to trigger their perfectionism, and right, it's, uh, it's difficult work um, in, in a lot of ways. It's difficult work. It can be hard work. And if you're a procrastinator, specifically, of one of the various forms of procrastinators, that, that just goes way up. Um, by this point in school, you've probably already got a pretty good sense if you are. Um, but sometimes the further you go on in school, if you're experiencing burnout, and this is a year for burnout, let me tell you, um, you may find that what once upon a time came quite easy to you now gives you significant resistance. Um, if you are having significant resistance, I recommend a book to you called The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. The War of Art. That's not The Art of War by Sun Tzu. It's The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. It's short. You could probably read it in an hour, tops two, uh, and deals very specifically with the question of resistance. So if you have newfound resistance and newfound issues with procrastination, go check that out. Okay, thing one. Thing two. There are a few different forms of procrastination. Um, I had a research study set up uh, on this at one point, but unfortunately we didn't get the backing for it. It's been kind of shelved. So there are a bunch of different forms of my analysis. Some of these you'll be very, very familiar with. Ah, oh. oh, lemonade. <clears throat> Pardon me. That is a tickle. 
Okay, some of these you'll be familiar with. So there is, for instance, the fear of the blank page. Fear of the blank page is I can't start. <clears throat> Sometimes the fear of the blank page is coupled with some other compensatory loops, like the loop that tells you you need to keep researching, right? I can't start yet. I have to keep researching. I have to read 19,000 books. I have to read more websites. I have to blah, 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 blah. No, you don't. Get your sources. Do a little research on the fly if you must. But at a certain point, if you're getting fear of the blank page, you have to just start. Just start. Start writing, and the writing will feel more natural. But it's hard to get over that bump. <clears throat> in the same way as I've said many times, that one of the great focuses and mysteries of my professional life has been that it can be so hard to say something. It can be so hard to say something. I'm also fascinated by the fact that it can be very hard to write something. And I am not excluded from this group. I find it exceptionally hard to begin pieces of writing and always have. I've written 23 day novels, very nearly 18, three day novels, um, many, many papers, lots of short stories, notes, uh, you know, you name it. I've written a lot. Uh, I figure probably now I've written north of 2 million words. Um, and that's not counting just like direct writing, like, you know, emails and stuff. And I, back in the day was kind of, I was a letter writer type email person. So, um, you know, I've done lots of writing, but I still get the fear of the blank page. You have to just start. Okay. Now there's the other one. The other one is the fear of completion. That's, you can't seem to get to the end. You get to the 90% and then you start like, ah, panicking and, and you go back and you're like, does my argument even make sense? Okay. There's that. These are editorial problems that you're dealing with. And what you need to do is turn your paper over to somebody else that can give you a more balanced assessment. Somebody that you trust reasonably well, or alternately, if you happen to know a smart 12 year old, uh, that's a good place to turn it over to because they don't have the knowledge, but they have the cognitive capacity. More on that later. The other type of procrastination, okay, the third one, we're not gonna go through all of these, but the third one that is uh, typically of significant importance in these cases, is the one that goes, um, you write the introduction and then you go back and you rewrite and then you rewrite and then you rewrite and then you rewrite and you get caught in a loop in the first kind of third of your writing. Okay, that's bad too. So <laughs> all of these things are things that I'm quite familiar with. I see in people all the time. I know that they're painful and that's why I generally take it as a given that yes, I know that when people are not writing their papers, they are a significant amount of the time watching shit on YouTube. Um, but I don't take that to mean that they are lazy and morally bankrupt. I take it to mean that they are coping with their anxiety because they are not able to connect through, right? Not able to connect to the work, they want to. Right? Or maybe they don't, they might find it boring, but the point is like at some level they want to, and they're just not able to enact their will. Luckily, this is a psychodynamic problem. Okay, so here are a few things I recommend. One, if you're the kind of person that gets locked up in endless revision, okay, endless like looping revision, uh, you need to write your first draft through. Just write it through without going back and reading it and critiquing it. Just write, 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 write. It's a draft. It's just a draft, it's fine. You're gonna take it, you print it off if you have to, stick it in a drawer for two days and don't look at it and don't think about it and stop picking at the scab. Then go back and ask yourself the question of what requires revision. What you will have on that page is raw material, bang out a full draft, okay? If you're the kind of person who has a hard time starting, you get fear of the blank page, here's what you need to do. You need to amp yourself up maximally, go time. Okay, it's like, we're doing this, we're doing this. The alarm, set an alarm for it. We're doing it, it's 10 a.m., we're gonna do this. Or if you're a night person, just admit that, put a cup of coffee on and do it. And then, you know, uh, personally speaking, I listen to music. When I write, I like to block out the world, but I also like to get my blood moving sometimes for certain kinds of writing or otherwise set the mood. So if music does your thing, do that. Consider using a, a binaural beat. If that's your thing, that can be quite useful. I believe I lectured on this in a previous lecture, but if you're not sure what I'm talking about and you're interested, um, just shoot me a message or come and ask me during discussion time and I'm happy to describe what I'm talking about. Um, there's a bunch of other technological things that you can throw at this. They are less important. Uh, they're interesting and everything, but they're sort of less important. However, one that is important, okay, is the word processor write or die. This thing has gone through a few different iterations. And the idea of write or die is it's pretty non bells and whistles online free word processor. 
with a very special feature. It's designed to get you writing and to keep you from stopping and freezing. And here's how it works. So you got your text box. Here you are, tickety, 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 tickety. There goes your essay, right? And it's got three levels of severity. I may have talked about this in one of the early lectures, but it's still, it's worth reminding. So it's got three levels of severity. The first one, if you stop typing for too long, it flashes some stuff at you, right? It's like some images and lights on the screen. Oh yeah, okay. And you go back to work. The second level, if you stop typing for too long, and I believe you can set the variation, um, and I suspect there's a pause button in case you need to go like pee or eat a sandwich. Uh, but, uh, you know, normally it's tick, tick, tick. So you stop writing for too long and you're sitting there and you're goofing around on your phone and you're whatever. Uh, at the second level, it flashes the lights and images, bah, 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 and it makes a horrible shrieky sound at you, uh, like a klaxon, like a, like a nuclear warning siren uh, that it blasts you. And that's often enough to get you back to work. But the third level is where the dark genius of write or die truly, truly, truly lives. Um, because at the third level, the third level, if you stop writing for too long, you've done, done your work, been working, you stop writing for too long and it flashes the lights and it makes the, the nuclear siren noise. And then it begins to erase what you've written. It starts to gobble it up. Now here's the thing, you might have written schmack, right, basically, you know, it may be a draft, what you may have written on this first thing may be largely incoherent or require serious revision or whatever, right, but the point is you'll still have an attachment to it. The second that it starts vanishing in front of you, that gets you back at the keys. So if you have to go to something that is kind of that level of motivational to just get yourself going, write or die, write or die. Okay, so those are some general tools. Um, let's talk a little bit about editing and then we'll talk about the process of writing. So editing, uh, I've talked about this in discussion too, but we, in the middle ages, people didn't know how to read in their heads. They read standing up at lecterns. In fact, the idea of reading in your head was considered sort of like vaguely sorceress and maybe kind of sketchy, right? So people read aloud at lecterns standing there. But at some point we got down this basic principle in literacy of reading in our heads. And we train kids to read in our heads. We hammer it into them, right? At first we get them to sit with the book and read what they're, no, what word do you see? Okay, read that out. And then eventually we're like, you know, read silently in your head. Okay, so that's, that's fine. If you are doing speed reading, if you've ever tried it with one of the mechanically assisted programs or one of the techniques, and I add, they're quite good. With one of those programs, when I was doing regular meditation and using TDCS, I had myself up to 1400 words a minute on reading, which is enough that I could sit down and reread the texts for a course before I went into the exam. Now, you shouldn't because of memory plasticity, but that's beside the point. Uh, if you want to speed read, you know, normally when you're reading in your head, you're literally using a little voice in your phonological loop in your head, right? You, like you're saying stuff to yourself, but you can suppress that. You can suppress that phonological loop and just read with your eyes. No audio language simulacrum at all. You can just blast ahead and read with your eyes. That is the secret to speed reading. And the you'll find if you train on it, there are free programs online you can use like Spreeder, Spreeder with an R. If you Google Spreeder, you could try one of these things. Get a sense for it. It's amazing how fast you can read if your phonological loop gets, gets cut out. For editing, however, you want exactly the opposite. Increasing your reading speed is about overlooking errors in the text and, and obtaining maximum transparency. When you're editing, you want exactly the opposite. When you're editing, you want to read through things in the most massively processed way possible. Now I have already said the one way to do this is reading out loud. Why? Because you have to read it with your eyes and you have to say it with your mouth. Then you have to listen to it with your ears and the associated brain areas for those three things means that you're processing the language vastly more. You're just chewing and rechewing it like a cow circulating its cud through multiple stomachs. You're going to pick up more. You're also going to pick up more because your verbal facilities are frankly vastly more developed and naturally developed, right, than your written facilities. Most you will, most people find that they are sort of generally speaking more confident in speech than they are in writing, not invariably, but sort of as a general rule, you'll pick stuff up. And there are some rules. It's like if you're reading something and you stumble, you should stop. 
and check your sentence. It might, there might be nothing wrong, but a lot of the time if you've stumbled, it's because either you've worded things awkwardly or there's something in the structure of the sentence like stop and read it. And if it sounds weird to you, then you need to change it. And that's the thing, it sounds weird to you. When a non-native English speaker sometimes uses an unusual grammatical construction, you can pick that up instantly. You can tell what the rules are without having to think in terms of parts of speech. You can just hear it. If you read your work out loud, you will hear when stuff is wonky a, a lot more often, okay? But you'll also slow things down. So you'll get a sense of where the argument chains. Now, if you can, draft somebody else into this too. Read them your work. So sit and read them. If they're not auditory processors, okay, fine. Let them read it along with you or something of the like, but get people to read it and read it both yourself or if you can find somebody to do it, as I mentioned, your ideal reader is the smart 12 year old. A smart 12 year old is about the level that you should be writing most undergraduate papers to unless you're in uh, writing something highly specialized. Why? because <clears throat> you do have to explain everything to get to your thesis, okay? So I'm not saying that you would write at the level that a 12-year-old would write, but 12-year-olds are quite capable of understanding things if they're smart. They're quite capable, even though they don't know that much about the world. This means that you have to explain things, but make the assumption that your reader is reasonably intelligent, okay? So, and for editing, and this is hard for people. I don't like doing it myself, but work in drafts. Okay, so one of the reasons this course has the uh, extended essay proposal is that that is in some ways a crypto draft. You make sure that you have to do something in advance because I'm aware of people's procrastination habits. So uh, you have to do something in advance and you may in fact make a significant amount of theoretical headway in your proposal. And then, you know, you're expanding that out when it comes to the paper. In some ways it's a draft. I don't like mandating actual drafts in class because, because I don't like doing them honestly. So, uh, so I don't do that. But generally speaking, I recommend work in drafts. Most good writing is actually rewriting. And you need to give yourself a bit of gap, right? Um, at least 48 hours, ideally, between trying to edit drafts. Before that, it's too fresh. So when you've written something, you know what you mean, right? And so it's easy for you to just pick up what you meant in the text instead of what you've actually written. Right. Whereas if you give it a couple of days, you read through it and you'll be much, much more likely to be like, I'm not sure this makes sense or this needs something or whatever. Right. Um, the other thing is that the farther back you go, the earlier it becomes the earlier. No, the farther back you go in time, the longer you can wait, the easier it becomes for you to do as Margaret Atwood once said, murder all your little darlings, which is to say that you will have rational attachments to certain things in your text, ideas, figures of speech bits of research you came across. Okay, if you absolutely have to keep something and it's not really part of your essay flow, stick it in a footnote. That's what footnotes are for. for they're for gloriously weird side points and stuff, in my opinion. I mean, that's one of the things they're for. Um, but you're gonna get things that you are attached to. It happens to me, happens to most of the writers I know. The longer a delay you can give yourself between drafts, the more likely it is gonna be the case that you can uptake an appropriately savage hatchet or machete, if you prefer, or scalpel, or chainsaw, to the, to the text and cut the things that need to be cut. Okay, last thing about editing, then we're gonna get into writing proper. Last thing about editing, a general rule that I advise for people, it's an iterative rule. Second draft equals first draft minus 10%. If you write a thousand words for your first draft, then one of the things is that your second draft, you should be able to edit it down to 900 words. People's writing tends to be full of needless words. Omit needless words. This is rule 19 in the older version of Strunk and White's The Elements of Style, one of the best, most concise writing guides available out there. In more recent versions, they seem to have omitted the phrase, omit needless words, and rule 19 in this, in my experience and belief and opinion, I suppose, is foolish. Rule 19, omit needless words. An easy way to do that is to give yourself this fixed thing. You have to crunch it in draft two from 1,000 down to 900. You have to. If you stick by that kind of rule of reducing it by 10%, are you going to add stuff back in after you hit 900? Yes, of course. You'll end up expanding it to some extent and being like, I need a bridging sentence here. I need a paragraph there. But 
when you hit third draft, third draft equals second draft minus 10%. Crunch it down because it gets you to throw out useless stuff at the sides, redundant sentences, repetition, words that really aren't doing anything or aren't evocative. You will squeeze it down and squeeze it down and squeeze it down. And trust me, it will be better for it. So second draft equals first draft minus 10%. Okay, that's the editing section. We still got 20 minutes left. <clears throat> Writing essays. The first thing to remember about an essay, if you haven't done this in a while, is that an essay is derived from the French SAA, that's with an EZ, meaning an attempt, to make an attempt. That's what an essay is. An essay is an attempt. It is not a mathematical proof most of the time. It's not, and I've talked about this when I talked about logical and analogical modes of reasoning, okay, and forms of logical and analogical argument. But most of the time, an essay, and certainly the kinds of essays you're going to write in this course, you can't wrap them up. They're not QED. It's not that kind of thing. You're making an attempt, and the attempt that you are making is an attempt to convince your reader of your argument. How do you convince somebody of something? Well, you do it with evidence and interpretation. We'll come back around to that. So it is an attempt. Now, what is it an attempt at? When you are writing an essay, and especially when you're writing an essay for this course, okay, and this is more, this is gonna be more for the long essay, but you know, you're gonna get some practice on the shorter one, right? You want to have a challenging thesis. Okay, a challenging thesis. What is a challenging thesis? A challenging thesis is a thesis which requires an argument. Pretty straightforward. It's a thesis that requires an argument. Some theses do not require an argument. You would not get any pushback, okay? So if you go to submit a paper in English class and your paper is, Shakespeare was quite an influential author or playwright, right? Oh, really? Thank you, right? This does not require an argument. Who would disagree with you? Some small group of people, I'm sure, would disagree with you, okay? But by and large, you're not going to get disagreement. It's not a challenging thesis, and therefore, it's not clear why you need an argument for it, right? If, on the other hand, you were to try to turn in a paper and your thesis was, Shakespeare, in fact, was not a very influential author. Okay, now, pause for a second and feel about how that statement hits you. Shakespeare, in fact, was not a very influential author. It demands evidence. If you were trying to tell that to somebody, if you were just talking to somebody, chatting them up or whatever, right? They'd be like, what do you mean? Like, you know, they would expect you to back that up in some way. That's what an essay is. You make an assertion, okay? <laughs> Which is like, you know, it has to be a reasonable assertion, but you make an assertion okay, which is your thesis, and then you propose a set of arguments and interpretations to back that up, and the attempt is the attempt to convince your reader. That's what it is, okay? So, um, challenging thesis. That particular note on challenging thesis came to me, actually, when I listened to an episode of Alan Cross's um, uh, Ongoing History of the New Music, which used to play on the edge. Um, I believe now he does it in podcast form, and what, what this thing was talking about, they were talking about Black Sabbath. And, uh, you know, which is interesting. It's a band I listened to. And the claim that was made was that the Beatles, okay, were not, in fact, a very big influence on, on music that came after them. And that threw me because I'm also a, a big Beatles fan. Uh, I'm a big fan of lots of things across many eras. But, uh, you know, if you're into music and you haven't really paid attention to the Beatles, you're missing. Uh, something like they were uh, very talented. So, you know, this claim that the Beatles were not influential was like, and the argument that he made is he's like, look, listen to modern music. How much of it sounds like Beatles music, Beatles music, and how much of it sounds like Black Sabbath? And I kind of thought about this and I was like, oh my God, totally. That, that is true. There are definitely lines of influence and things, but if you just listen to the catalog of music, you turn on the radio randomly, you're not going to hear something that sounds like the Beatles. You're going to hear, unless you hear the Beatles, uh, you're going to hear far more likely to hear something that is, has sort of inherited its code from um, Black Sabbath. Now, Black Sabbath was, you know, uh, Satan plus, um, uh, plus, uh, uh, kind of uh, particularly raspy blues stuff, plus, um, you know, it, it has its own antecedents, right, in, in rock and hard rock. Um, but as an example, if you happen to like the band uh, Arctic Monkeys, the song that they have, which is, what's that song called? Arabella. 
Arabella um, has a, a riff in it that is lifted almost exactly from Black Sabbath. It's remarkable. So, uh, whereas I don't think they're lifting anything from the Beatles. So you see what I mean? It immediately provoked in me a little bit of, right? That required some explanation. That's a challenging thesis. That's what you want to come at. Now, let's talk about general essay structure. If you have learned almost no essay structure at all, you will have learned one thing. You will have learned the hamburger essay, sometimes called the five paragraph essay. Okay, so what's the hamburger essay? Introduction, body paragraph, body paragraph, body paragraph, conclusion. Okay, now here's the thing. The hamburger essay, the hamburger model, uh, or the five paragraph model isn't wrong. It's not wrong. That's why we use it with people. It's a pretty good training structure. But stopping at that structure is a little bit like going to architecture school and them telling you, you know, lesson one, a building has four walls and a roof. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it does it. Um, right? That's kind of, it's like a house has four walls and a roof. Yes, that's true. That's true. And, but if you stop there, you, you will not go into the more advanced reaches. It's a bit more complicated. However, it is still a useful tool to train on because it, it has the, the conceptual and, and mechanical machinery of the essay boiled down, okay? So, and let's look at it because the way that they teach it a lot of the time is kind of screwy. So what are the five parts? I guess I could do this in like a diagram. Here, let's do that. Okay, so what are the five parts? Okay, so, huh, lovely. So what are the five parts? We all know this, right? So the, the top layer, uh, such as it is, la la la. Okay, the top layer, such as it is, which we'll call the bun layer, <laughs> okay, is your introduction. What are the three middle layers? Um, they are paragraph one, which I call cheese, paragraph two, um, Kind of hamburger is this? Anyway, okay, paragraph two, right? Which is your meat and cheese. What do you put under meat? Relish, I guess. Sure, why not? And paragraph three, I don't actually like relish, but that's beside the point. Then you have your uh, your sort of final paragraph and what's your final paragraph? Your final paragraph is your conclusion, okay? So you have introduction, body one, body two, body three, conclusion. Now. Again, that's a, a fine, very introductory structure. However, there are some things that people leave out of this. What are the parts of the introduction? Well, the very first thing that an introduction needs that they don't typically teach is it needs a hook. It needs a hook. You have to have something to catch your reader's attention, period. That might be a narrative intro. It might be a clever quote. It might be, um, you know, a, a, a striking uh, opening line or assertion, but you need something. If you just come in right off the bat with this essay is about whatever, you're going to get hurt. And I'll tell you why. Because the more writing you do, and this applies to all forms of writing, but it does also apply to essay writing. You turn your essay in in a class and your TA has, let's say, 50 or your prof has 50 different papers to write or to read rather. There is a sorting process which a lot of people use, consciously or unconsciously, and it has to do with what they encounter right away. It's a kind of first impression model. What you want is to sell your paper. You cannot make your argument to the person unless they're willing to go on the ride. So catch their attention. Say something interesting right away, okay? That's your hook. And we can talk more about that uh, as we go on. Again, this stuff will be more applicable. So I'll release probably expanded versions of some of this as we get closer to the big essay, but it's stuff to think about. Okay, then you're gonna have your topic sentence broadly, which is to say the broad subject that you're talking about. So, you know, Russian history. So your first, you know, your first, or let's say French history. Your first line is, uh, uh, you know, uh, Madame uh, Defarge, who famously clicked her knitting needles together uh, below the bloody stage where they decapitated nobles of the French Revolution, um, you know, was uh, a remarkably uh, ahead of her time figure. There, that's a hook. I just caught you. It had blood and knitting, okay, and, and political upheaval. Um, the point is like, it's interesting, right? I probably got your attention with that first line. Okay, two, we say, um, you know, the history of political upheaval in France, uh, you know, is a complex and variegated subject, right? Broad topic, 
two. In this paper, we'll be specifically looking at the question of whether or not upheavals in 1848, right, um, followed certain, you know, this question, right? Here's the, here's the question. And I'm going to propose that we, that, uh, you know, it, that there was political upheaval. Okay, so there's your thesis. Well, maybe actually to make it a challenging, we'll say there wasn't political upheaval, okay? Fine. And then you're going to tell me where you're going. You're gonna give a roadmap, okay? This is the absolute basics, but you're gonna give a roadmap. You're gonna say, I am going to uh, attempt to examine this question in terms of X, Y, and Z, very briefly. You're just pointing where you're going, you're pointing ahead. Okay, then body one, you're gonna introduce a piece of evidence. What do we mean by evidence? Okay, so an early exercise that I did when I taught essay writing to high school students was pretty simple. I would ask the class a simple question. Who would win in a fight between Batman and Wolverine? Okay, who would win in a fight between Batman and Wolverine? Seemingly simple question, but people have strong opinions about these. And you know, like 15 year old boys who otherwise do not care about English class will have often strong opinions about this question. Who would win in a fight between Batman and Wolverine? Now I'm quite capable of arguing either side of this, but typically in a group, they would polarize off, okay? So then uh, I would, right, they, they would polarize off and they would start what? Arguing with each other. Okay, so people would start shouting up points, right? They would start saying, um, you know, whatever, this, this, this. And I'd be like, okay, slow down, slow down. Let's take these down. So, you know, organize yourselves on either side, the Wolverine side and the Batman side. Okay, why would Batman win? And people will start giving points. And then you can categorize those points. You know, they'll be like, well, you know, it's a fact that Batman never loses or um, Batman has no superpowers, but Wolverine has healing factor and his skeleton's made of metal and he has sideburns. Batman doesn't have sideburns, whatever. The point is that people will give you a series of arguments. In some cases, surprisingly complicated arguments. Try this with a group of people sometimes. I've had people give me arguments about this kind of thing that involved like a surprising amount of math. Like people take it seriously. The point is each one of these arguments is basically an attempt in one way or another to present a fact to you, okay, a piece of evidence, and then interpret that in favor of a particular kind of conclusion. That is what's happening in your body paragraphs, where the evidence typically is something that you are citing specifically, and then you are interpreting that, right? So you're providing a, a you're making a claim, you're providing a piece of evidence, so a citation from one of the books that you've researched, one of the ideas you've come across, and then you are seeking to support it, okay, with your interpretation. That's what it is. Okay. Um, the three body paragraphs, such as it is, and this is an absolute minimum structure, okay? Like, there's far more complex ways of handling essays, but like this is minimum, okay? So the three body paragraphs, frankly, should be kind of different, which is to say that they should be using relatively different pieces of evidence so that their evidence is convergent, okay? And we, we will come to that when I tell you a story in a moment, okay? So that's what each of those body paragraphs is doing. And then we get to the conclusion. What does the conclusion do? Does the conclusion restate the thesis? No, no, it does not. <laughs> so one of the mistakes that I see, frankly, both teachers and students make quite regularly is they say this. In the introduction, you say what you're going to say. And in the body, you say what you're saying. And then in the conclusion, you say what you said. No, no, like, no, that's not true. The three broad components, two buns in the middle chunks of the hamburger are not all supposed to do the same thing. It is not the case that you are just repeating yourself in the conclusion, what you said in the introduction. Rather, you are synthesizing what you've said. You are synthesizing it. You're not introducing new material. I presume you know that, but you're synthesizing it. You're bringing it together because you've got separate points. You are bringing them together into a conclusion. You're synthesizing them into the final point that you want to make. This is why these three intersecting lines of evidence now provide such a strong argument. Okay. Then, you know, you hit the standard things, uh, limits, speculations, what we might go further, you know, you know future work might focus on whatever. Okay, and then at last, you're going to give your outro. And this is the, this is the mirrored complement to the hook. The hook is a big funnel designed to pull your reader's attention in. Okay, and then the, you see how the introduction gradually focuses things down into the narrow thing and then takes it through your argument. And at the end, when your conclusion 
finishes, you open it back up, you connect it back with the world. So this is what I call the so what, okay? And here's how it worked. I would read my students' papers. And when I taught English, high school English, I made my students start by writing an essay a week and then gradually go to writing two essays a week and then proceed to writing three essays a week. And eventually they would write four essays a week. They would write an essay on Monday, an essay on Tuesday, an essay on Wednesday, an essay on Thursday. And if, they, if everybody had finished all their homework, we would play a role-playing game together on Friday. Um, typically we'd play Murder at Teenager Lake, a slasher film played with the Jenga-based system Dread. It's a lot of fun. So, uh, but they all had to, they all had to all have their homework done, which I add also suddenly turned the formula of peer pressure into something completely different. Um, there was more work to be had unless everybody was finished. And so suddenly people were like, you, you'd better get your homework done. Do you need help? Uh, change the classroom culture completely. Anyway, the point is four essays a week. If they turned one of these essays into me and I read through the whole thing and I got to the end and they didn't have this reconnecting with the world and stuff part, then I would ask them the question, okay, so what? And if they didn't have a good answer for me, it's like, if they couldn't tell me why any of what they just argued in this matters, why does any of this matter? I was like, well, then you're not done. <laughs> if you write an essay, if you get the whole way through an essay and you cannot answer the question, so what? Why does this matter? You wrote the wrong essay and you probably had a hard time doing it, frankly. You should figure out where the material connects to you and what's significant about it. That's an extremely important part of the work. The hook, yeah, it's a bit of advertising. It's designed to pull your attention in. Then you run the argument through, but like, don't just run horseshit arguments that you don't believe in. Run arguments, I mean, test your own beliefs, obviously, and we'll deal with that at greater length again when we get closer to the big paper. But, you know, when you connect it back out, it should matter. It should have some impact. It should connect with the world in some way. It should connect with you know, your life, other people's lives, actual problems in the actual world. If your essay does not actually connect with things, and that could be pretty abstract depending on the field, but if it doesn't actually connect with things in some meaningful way, if it doesn't change the perception of a thing, if it doesn't offer potential solutions, if it doesn't outline potential problems, if it doesn't do something in terms of so what, then it's pointless. It does not exist for any good reason. It's just frippery, okay? So the so what is where your essay ends, right? So if the hook brings things in, focus things down, take it through your arguments, right? Right, claim, evidence, interpretation, and then you synthesize it, then you broaden it back out, and then you reconnect it to the world in the so what. And that is a five paragraph essay, okay? In, in its structural sense. Now you can elaborate all this stuff. You can have, you know, more than three sections in the middle. Each of those sections may have subsections. They could have sub arguments, things that you have to establish or talk about before you can talk about another thing. An essay might deal with more than one problem, right? So it might be like this essay is really going to deal with this problem and this problem and then put them together, in which case there's lots of different things potentially that can be done within that structure. But you see how the basics work. It's a machine. And the machine, the point of this machine is to take a challenging thesis, catch my attention, and then by taking my attention through this, render that thesis plausible to me. By the end of your essay, I should go, huh, yeah, okay. That doesn't necessarily mean I'm 100%. It may be the case that I know things or I, your reader knows things or just has hard disagreements or whatever. But the point is you should have rendered it plausible, okay? Now that's one of the reasons why research is important when you're doing work, because it's easy to come up with something off the top of your head and then find out that somebody knocked the hell out of it in 1942. And it's impossible. And when I taught cognitive science, I hit papers like this pretty regularly. You know, people would turn in papers where it was challenging, but their scope was too big. They would be like, here's my amazing new reason why uh, I should just be able to build an artificial intelligence and I figured it out. And they would propose it and I'd be like, okay, please see this author, this author, this author. Like, this, you're not the first person to think of this and it doesn't work and here's why. Like, and there are deep theoretical problems with it, right? So that's one of the reasons it's important to do research to make sure that what you're proposing, you know, isn't just gonna get its legs swept. Now. You also are not writing a PhD thesis, so the expectation isn't that you're going to have an exhaustive encyclopedic knowledge of the field. But, you know, you need to have something, right? Anyway, the point is that it should render things plausible. It takes a challenging thesis, it runs it through this kind of machine, and it renders it plausible. 
you run a good game. Okay. Now, one of the things I'm going to talk a little longer than the 45 seconds available to me, so I'm going to pause this. One of the things that um, you know comes out of this. Um, okay. Well, so I'll talk about the, the practice. When I taught the students, and I would break them into um, Batman versus Wolverine, right? Make them argue. I would then often do a thing on the next pass where I would say, okay, okay, who would win then in a fight between Superman and Thor? And again, people would start to polarize. And once they had polarized, but before they started shouting out arguments, I would say, great, you're going to write an essay on this, but I want you to argue against your position. I want you to write an argument against your position. Okay, this is a classic in debate club. Classic debate club, you do not get a choice about which side you're arguing. You learn to argue both sides. Right? You learn how to do this thing of rendering plausible arguments for both sides. And it's an important skill for flexibility of mind. Now, it may not be the case that you ultimately believe these positions, but the point is that you're taking them seriously and you're using argumentation seriously. When you are writing a paper, you should occasionally attack your own points. You should play chess against yourself, which is to say that you should read your paper with a relatively like critical view within the game and try to tear your own points down. Because if you don't do that, you're again, bleh, you're leaving big holes in what you've got, big holes. If instead you take the time and periodically read it in that critical way or get somebody else, although if somebody else does it often, it, like it, it bugs you, it'll hurt your feelings and then you'll be kind of pissed off at them and you get defensive. If you do it yourself, on the other hand, you're committing yourself to this intellectual practice of I've been sitting on the black side of the chessboard, I'm rotating the board and now I play white. I'm playing against myself. Get in the habit of doing this regularly, okay, of coming at your own ideas. And when you're doing writing, it's really important. It's really important because it'll strengthen your work, okay, it'll strengthen your arguments. Okay. Whew, it's hard to fit all this in. Okay, I'm going to keep talking because uh, I don't have much time. So I'm going to tell you guys a story that brings this stuff together. And it has to, a little bit to do with, uh, you'll see, essay structure and a little bit to do with the importance of convergent arguments. And I want to use it as a metaphor. So uh, here we go. Here's my story. So when I very first moved to Toronto in the year 1997, oh, those many moons ago, uh, when I first moved here in 1997, I was originally supposed to uh, live with a, with a good friend of mine, uh, two good friends, actually, my, at the time, my business partner and, uh, and one of my best friends. And one of my best friends went here to U of T. My business partner was going to be going to U of T and uh, I was going to be working for a digital media company and I had a business as an inventor. That's a separate story. Okay. But um, originally I was supposed to live with those two guys and we were supposed to have this apartment that was above a shawarma shop and it was terrific because um, the heat in the place was so high that we figured we could, you know, basically be in short straight through the winter and uh, you got 50% off shawarmas. So um, this seemed like it was going to be a wonderful situation where we would, I guess, I don't, I don't know, hang, hang around in our underwear and eat shawarma. Now that I say it, that doesn't sound that good, but it seemed good at the time. That's what we were going to do. So going to move to Toronto and do this. Unfortunately, my friend, not my business partner, but my other good friend, uh, his parents caught wind of the fact that the three of us were moving in together and they didn't much care for me. Um, they thought I was, quote, a bit of a wild child. Um, and uh, they didn't think I was an especially good influence on him. <clears throat> Full disclosure, I wasn't always. So anyway, they... Uh, basically said to put the kibosh on the whole thing and said, no, 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 you are not, you're not moving in together. Uh, and they set him up in his, his own apartment over on McCall, uh, south of campus. So that suddenly left uh, my business partner and I in the lurch. And my friend felt bad enough that he went to uh, guys who lived in uh, res uh, at Vic. And these guys were uh, moving out. As it turns out, they were not moving out of residence. They were getting kicked out of residence, but he didn't tell me that at the time. So they were getting a house down on Elm Street, right by Bay. And so um, he sort of brokered this arrangement and I moved in with these guys. And as it turned out, my business partner and I moved in and uh, uh, it was, a, it was a, a happy and felicitous event uh, because a bunch of those guys are still quite good friends of mine. Um, yeah, uh, and, uh, one of them is uh, my friend T. Bradley Richards, who is a, a philosophy instructor at uh, 
uh, Ryerson and uh, my friend Rory Lavelle, who's a musician. He's currently living in Germany and a bunch of these guys. Uh, yeah. So um, terrific house, very interesting, full of stories. But I still wanted to be in contact with my, with my friend, right, who lived over on McCall. And so, you know, we talked on the phone periodically and so on and so forth. This was back in the day when you still talked on a landline. And then um, one day I had what I thought was actually a, a really brilliant idea, um, which was uh, I, I figured out how I could build a video phone. Now, this is especially hilarious telling this over Zoom because this is now so antiquated, but we're talking about 1996, 1997. So this was not an easy thing to do. Broadband internet was not commercially available. I got it as soon as it came out. Um, so, but video phone. Okay, so I, so I had this idea. It was, it was, I thought, a pretty good idea. Okay, so here's the, here's the idea basically. Okay, so you take two televisions. Luckily, we each had one, okay? Pretty simple. Okay, and each of these televisions, of course, these are old school TVs, right? Like this. So not, not quite that bad, but they're old school TVs. Okay, so we each got a TV, fine. And then each of those TVs, okay, we put a VCR on the TV, a uh, video cassette recorder, <clears throat> a VHS machine, okay? Now, an interesting quirk of the VCR Okay, for what it's worth, is that VCRs for some reason had uh, two different um, kind of channels, okay, that you could output or input the VCR, like the video stream on, channel three and channel four. Okay, I don't know why it was like that, but that's how it was. So here was the idea I had. So we each had a TV. So you put a video camera on top of the TV, okay? It's like, again, a pretty old school video camera, but it's, it's not that hard to do, okay? And so let's uh, face this video camera. Oop. No, stop it. Let's face this video camera this way, okay? And let's face this video camera this way, okay? Okay, great, so we got a couple of video cameras. And we take this video camera and we run its output, uh, right, into channel three on the VCR, okay? And then we run channel three out to an amplifier and you amplify this out with an antenna and you are suddenly broadcasting on channel three. Pretty simple, right? Okay, uh, and much simpler actually than radio, which requires some relatively specialized technologies. Okay, so then we take this camera and we output this camera to channel four and we connect this to the VCR, right, uh, properly, and then we connect it to an amp, and then we output that through an antenna, right? We amplify it, we output it through an antenna, and boom, what do we got? We're broadcasting, so we're broadcasting on channel three, and we're broadcasting on channel four, okay? Pretty neat. Then we take the television and we tune it, cross-tune it to the respective channels. So TV also had an antenna, right? TV has an antenna of its own, this TV has an antenna of its own. And you take these two antenna and then you set this television, right? To channel four. And you set this television to channel three. Okay, so let's say that uh, I live over here on Elm Street. And my friend lives way over here on McCall, okay? So this is obviously not to scale and I've missed some streets, but the point is, okay. And weirdly I put north at the bottom instead of the top, whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, it's weird, I'm facing down from campus in this image very clearly. Anyway, okay, so we got these two TVs. So I got one of these, Aguiz got one of these and he got like a camera on top of a TV set, fine. So this one is broadcasting, right, at, uh, at three. And this one is receiving at three. This one's broadcasting at four. This one's receiving at four. And what do you suddenly have? A real-time video link. You're, you're right, you sit in front of the camera and in real time, you appear on your friend's television, right? Broadcast at the speed of light. Very, very straightforward. Okay, cool. This is neat. Um, and so, you know, whatever, you can shoot the shit or, you know, watch your friend eat breakfast cereal or do whatever you're going to do. It's just kind of a kind of a cool thing that you can do. Okay, so neat, right? Um, 
so uh, so that's interesting. Um, and what I didn't know uh, at the time was uh, that this is illegal. Um, you're not allowed to do that. <laughs> um, and and with good reason, people pay. I mean, we don't have channels in this way now because it's it's digital channels mostly. But people, of course, pay for particular channels. Uh, and you can understand how it would be perhaps annoying if you decided to uh, tune into channel three. Uh, in order to watch your show. Uh, and instead you were watching some idiot talk to his friend while his friend ate cornflakes. So anyway, it's illegal uh, is the important thing. Okay, now the fact that it is illegal, okay, um, means that there are uh, officers who enforce this, right? And uh, in Canada, I believe it is the uh, uh, CRTC that enforces this. Okay, so how do they do it? So we're gonna do this one so properly north. How would they do it? How do they figure this stuff out? Like if you've got somebody broadcasting like this and they don't you know, just stupidly say their name on air or whatever, um, how do you know where they're illegally broadcasting from, right? So this is North. So we got uh, one friend lives here, right? Oh, let's do it with, uh, let's do it like this. There we go. Okay, so we got, you know, one friend lives here and you got the friend over here lives there. Okay, great. So let's say that you're looking to locate this person because he's, you know, especially uh, annoying. The other person is quietly eating a cereal, but this person is bad. Let's say you're looking to find them. How do you do that? How do you do it? How do you locate that person? Right? Okay, so some of you will probably be familiar with this, but what you do is you use a technique called triangulation. So how does this work? Works like so. Okay, so the CRTC, right, will have a van. Uh, back in the, they have more sophisticated technology now, but back in the day it was a van. The van has like a, like a dish, right? Um, on top and, and various antennae and stuff. And so you take the van someplace, okay? Um, you take the van someplace and you park it someplace where you're clearly within the radius of the effect. And then you uh, start sweeping your, your dish back and forth, right? And you're sweeping your dish, you're sweeping your dish back and forth so that you can get a sense of the maximum strength. So you can imagine the dish sweeps up this way and it's like right? Okay, fine. So then from where you're sitting, you know which way the dish is pointing and you draw a line from there. Okay, boom. Then you you know, pack your stuff up and you relocate the van and you relocate it to, oh, oh, you relocate it to here, let's say. Okay, then you do the same thing. You repeat the procedure, right? So you swing the dish and the dish is like, correct the cereal. Right, okay, good. You know which way, the, oops. No, nope, that's not what I want. You know which way the dish is pointed. And so you draw another line. Okay. And then if you really want to know, because you're in a city of high rises, if you need to specify something in three dimensions, you need a third line. So what do you do? You locate a third uh, spot. Let's say park your van. Okay. Let's say you park your van here. Okay. And you do the same thing. You sweep your dish. Okay, now you probably also have some sense of the strength because you're considerably closer, but leave that aside for a second. You draw another line in the map. Okay, now notice, notice what you've got here is you have an intersection point, you have a convergence between these three lines. Okay, now if you were just going by the red line, it could be any number of houses. It could be a house here. It could be a house here. It could be a house here. It could be a house here, right? If you want to specify, you know, you need at least two to specify in two dimensions, and you need three to specify in three dimensions because you potentially have to offset, right? Raising and lowering, right? If you have like a multi story building. There's a lot more of those here than there were in 1997, but they're around. And I live in one of the ones actually that, that would have been around in the time. This building was built in 1980. So you've got these three convergent points. And then what do you do? You send your enforcement officers to go knock on the door and kindly ask the person to, you know, 
turn off their pirate TV rig. Okay, so um, so that's that's what what one one would do. Okay, now why am I talking about any of this? Because this is a relatively straightforward model that you can think of to use when you are considering essay writing. Okay, so the question of the essay, right? What is the challenging question? The question is, where is that signal coming from? Who, who, who is this person? Where's the signal coming from? Okay, and you have perhaps a rough hypothesis. I think it's coming from kind of here, right? But then you have to run three lines of evidence. You have to pick these three spots. And the whole idea is each of these lines of evidence is essentially individually taking a kind of a reading, right? Here is some evidence, right, in this direction. But notice, if these three points were clustered really tightly together, it would be quite hard to figure out where this is. It's easier to figure out the further apart they're spaced, right? The farther apart your measurements are, the easier triangulation becomes, okay? That's important. Why? Because the same thing is true of um, the arguments within your body paragraph. So if we go back to the hamburger essay, your three middle paragraphs should have three different kinds of evidence, three different forms of argument. They should have three distinct lines. If two of them are taken from almost the same location, it's weak. It'll read weak, right? Okay, so you want to kind of come at it from multiple directions now, because this is an interdisciplinary course, that's comparatively easier to do. But even if you're not coming at it from three different disciplines, you can come at it with three different lines of argument, and those arguments then converge. Once they converge, you've synthesized them. Okay, each of the individual lines of argument. Okay, so, so the first question, the question is, where's that damn signal coming from? And you're like, I think that signal is coming from a house on Elm Street. And in order to uh, address the question, I plan on taking measurements from point A, or from point yellow, from point red, and from point blue, right? There's your introduction. Um, Okay, then you run point yellow, point red, and point blue, body paragraph one, body paragraph two, body paragraph three. Finally, you look on paper and you see where these three things have synthesized, which is say your three lines of argument should come together to give you something that is greater than the simple sum of the parts, right? You should get something more integrated and richer than just the sum of yellow argument, red argument, and blue argument, or the three middle parts of the hamburger, okay? It, it should synthesize. Um, those of you who have been coming to the Thursday night discussions or to office hours will have already heard me making arguments about the strength of synthesis. But one very quick version that I can give you is this. The reason that you have two eyeballs is so that you can synthesize the information together. And why does that matter? You can close one of your eyes and hold a pen up and still see that pen. You can close your other eye and hold a pen up and still see that pen, right? So you only need one eye, except that's not true. Because if you switch rapidly between your two eyes, the pen will seemingly jump back and forth. But when both of your eyes are open, you don't see those two separate pen images overlaid on each other. You see one pen with depth. And depth is what the two eyes gets you. The synthesis of those two information streams literally allows you to add a dimension of depth. It's triangulation. Okay, so synthesis adds depth. And when you are synthesizing together these three things, it should tell you more in some sense. The interplay between the three arguments should reveal more in the synthesis than it did any of those arguments individually. And then finally, in the conclusion, you open the door and you see what's inside, right? So this is a reasonable quick model. I like this because I just like the story. Um, uh, but also, uh, I have found over the years that people find it some, a somewhat useful uh, uh, touch point to recall. So this is the task. You are making an attempt. You are trying to run through uh, argumentation, right? You are trying to come up with an idea, and it's a little challenging, it, and it means something to you. And you run through these convergent attempts, and bang, you got an essay. Okay, so that's sort of essay one. We're gonna do essay two with some deeper stuff. I apologize for the speed at which I spoke. I still didn't make it in 40 minutes. So I don't know if I'm glad that I spoke really fast. I guess I am, but I'm gonna cut it there because I don't wanna overwhelm people. So next week I will do Watchmen and we will cover um, some other extended stuff and we're getting close to the end of the semester folks. So 
So here we go. Uh, next week is your essay. If you haven't started yet, uh, you should do that. If you need an extension, you know the drill, just ask for one. It's, it's fine. Okay. All right. So I hope to see people tonight. Talk to you soon.